And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Sally Ferguson. Thank Sally you. Ferguson is an assistant professor of midwifery at the University of Canberra in Australia. She has been a midwife since 1986 and, has, and was part of the original midwifery team at the birth center of the Canberra Hospital. Her, and her passion for midwifery is obvious as you go, as you will see. And she's speaking to us today about salutogenesis in midwifery. So with no further ado, I turn it over to you, Sally. Thank you, Lorraine. And thank you, everyone, for, for having me. You may want um, to turn up your microphone just a little bit, Sally. You can just okay. adjust. Click on the little, the little icon, uh, the little down arrow next to your microphone, and adjust your microphone volume. Is that better? There, much better. There oh, you go. Okay, okay. All right. So just tell me throughout if I need to raise my voice a bit. All right. The aim of my presentation is to explain uh, salutogenesis to those of you who aren't familiar with the idea and continue to establish its relevance for midwifery because salutogenesis and midwifery fit beautifully together. I'm doing a PhD on salutogenesis and childbearing, so I'm absolutely immersed in it, um, and I'm beginning to understand it. So um, I hope that I can help you to understand and motivate you to think about salutogenesis in your free data data. So to help us to understand um, salutogenesis, I'd like to introduce you to Aaron Antonovsky. Aaron Antonovsky is an Israeli medical sociologist who created the concept. And Antonovsky would tell you that salutogenesis is a concept focusing on discovering the causes of health rather than the causes of illness. So as a medical sociologist, it annoyed Antonovsky that pathogenesis was used to frame health promotion. He did not understand, as we don't understand, why that would be the case. As we all know, that health is not just So he, Antonovsky, wanted to create a health promotion framework, something that would rival pathogens. And he started his work with Holocaust survivors um, and thought that he would find a lot of pathology when he looked at these people. And he did, but there was a particular bunch of people um, he found who not only survived the Holocaust, but they thrived. So he decided that they must have had some that promote. So that started him thinking about This group fascinated him, and he did 51 interviews with them um, to break, to, to try and work out what exactly that they had, to, that they could stay well. And in the end, years and years later, in the end, um, he came to, up with the concept of, of sense of coherence. So Antonovsky would say that those people who thrived in that setting had strong sense of coherence. And sense of coherence is the working unit of salutation. So they, they go together. So be, um, and we'll talk about salutogenesis in a minute, but before we do that, let's create the relevance of So, as you know, as I know, um, and here Sue Down tells us, that maternity services are currently rooted in pathology. You know that, the um, tertiary service. Um, in Tertiary maternity services, we love to focus on risk, don't we? Um, we love to categorise women in relation to their risk. And even though we know this has dire consequences for their child. Um, Down says, and Antonovsky says, said, if risk is emphasised and health is de-emphasised, then you end up with a risk focused maternity service where you have soaring labour intervention rates, soaring variant. 
Down says and Antonovsky say and other people say, you know from psychology that we get what we get. So if we are emphasizing Sally, if I could just interrupt you for a moment. Sure. Um, do you have a, your microphone nice and close to your to your mouth because your mic is your voice is fading in and out a little bit. Ah, uh, is it? Is it? Is that? How is that? That's much better. Just keep your microphone okay. wherever that okay. is, and all right. We'll and interrupt around. me again if, if it goes away. If I go away. We'll, um, so we'll what we're talking about is that you get what you emphasise in life and in maternity services. So if you're going to emphasise risk, then that's exactly what you're going to get. And in normal childbirth. Down tells us that our labor, in soaring labour intervention rates and our soaring cesarean section rates um, are related to the fact that we are driven by pathogenesis and we are emphasising risk. You might not know that Australian cesarean section rates are increasing a percentage point a year and spontaneous vaginal birth uh, rates are going down a percentage point a year. So if we keep going like this, in 12 years we cross over and we have more caesarean section in Australia than normal birth. So that's such a scary idea. Pathogenesis is not working uh, for our maternity services and we need another way uh, to look at the world where we emphasise and create the normal. I mean, that's what midwives do so beautifully. They create the normal and that's what we're meant to be doing. So eutogenesis offers the midwife so much more. Um, and Antonovsky would say, why not look at a person's health factors rather than their risk factors? And that's what salutogenesis invites us to do. It invites us to look at a woman's health factors. Um, if we get what we emphasise, then that's what we need to be doing. That doesn't mean we ignore Margot's polyhydramnius. That would be stupid. Um, but what it does mean is that in the equation you have the fact that she is a well woman having a well baby, um, she's supported by a midwife that she knows and loves, that she has a doula, that she has a lovely partner, that she will have continuous support in labour, that she spectacularly birthed her four kilo um, baby girl two years ago. These are all things that need to be in that equation when we're providing care to Margot so that we balance risk, health uh, and all the factors. Uh, Francis Day Sturk, who we've uh, just heard from so eloquently now, and Louise Palmer talk about salutogenic birth. They're two of only a few authors that are talking about salutogenic in relation to childbearing. Um, and they emphasise the midwife's role in increasing a woman's sense of coherence and ultimately their childbearing health. Sinclair and Stockdale do the same. They say that salutogenesis offers midwives an opportunity to positively influence public health by empowering and motivating women to confidently take control of their childbearing. Isn't that beautiful? Salutogenesis offers midwives an opportunity to positively influence public health by empowering and motivating women to confidently take control of their childbearing. Uh, and so this would occur through the enhancement of the saluto concept of sense of coherence. So that's the essence that Antonovsky found with the Holocaust survivors. So let's talk about sense of coherence. So this woman is driving my PhD and she's a hard taskmaster. Um, she represents all the women that I've ever cared for as a midwife who have uh, easily able to who are easily able to tap into their birthing zone and they just go on to uh, birth in the most spectacular way. You know this woman who fills her room up with um, beautiful endorphins and you know that you should have brought your knitting because you're not going to be doing anything. You're just going to be being with her. So remember Antonovsky's Holocaust survivors? Well, this woman represents them for me. So th this woman I knew had the essence, that health-promoting 
um, that I wanted to think about in relation to those dreadful that what is it that this woman knows that other women don't know? What can she teach other women? What can she teach uh, midwives? So the um, so strong. If you have strong sense of coherence, and I believe that that's what this woman has, then you see your world or the hard thing that you're doing as comprehensive. So this woman, um, her child childbearing makes sense. She understands what she's doing. That there is a manageability component. So she believes that she can do this hard thing. She believes that she uh, either has the resources or can realise the resource with their potential. She can go and seek out midwifery care. She can go and do all the things she needs to do to get the support that she needs to manage the hard thing. And the best bit is the meaningfulness for me because that is what Stockdale and Sinclair are talking about. That's the active component. That's the motivational aspect. So um, if so this woman clearly childbearing has meaning for her, it has value for her, and she's motivated, isn't she, to um, to be able to take her uh, birthing baby. So it creates a sort of um, so she's motivated enough, she understands the concept, she can rally her existing and potential resources. And what that creates is a sort of optimism which is, is just lovely. So a lovely optimism which to work and think about your work. Um, so salutogenesis literature review. Um, so as we just said, uh, sense of coherence is the working unit of salutogenesis. So let's just go back and see what, sal what they say about salutogenesis in the literature. So salutogenesis has become an important health promoting concept in Europe and especially in, in um, Scandinavia. And there's thousands of studies on salutogenesis and sense of coherence. And generally speaking, if you have strong sense of coherence, you have better physical health, uh, that is you have less chronic disease, um, less diabetes, less cancer. You have better emotional health, that is you have less depression, less anxiety and less post-traumatic stress disorder amongst other things. You have better health behaviours, that is you clean your teeth for longer, you eat better, you drink less alcohol, you smoke less cigarettes and you do more physical exercise. And a systematic review by Ericsson and Lindstrom in 2006 concluded that strong sense of coherence leads to better health, especially uh, emotional health. So there's thousands of articles on salutogenesis and sense of coherence on general health, but only I could only find 17 on childbearing. So let me tell you about that. Um, I'm just about to publish this literature review on sense of coherence and childbearing, and what I found was women with low sense of coherence, and this gets measured on Antonovsky's um, orientation to life questionnaire. He devised a 29.1, 13.1. Most people use the 13.1. Okay. So women with low sense of coherence. Can you hear me? No, Is that all right? Keep your microphone nice and stable, oh. please. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. So women. Okay. Women with low sense of coherence have experience more premature labour. They smoke, they're more likely to smoke in a pregnancy and beyond. They uh, claim to be dissatisfied with their partners. They rate their baby as more fractious. They experience low emotional and physical well-being and more major life worries. They have more stress and depressive symptoms. And if you ask them in a pregnancy, they would say that they want to have a caesarean section for their birth. Women with high sense of coherence um, have more uncomplicated birth. They choose more home birth. 
they have greater well-being in pregnancy, they have less post-traumatic stress disorder and less depression after miscarriage. And if you ask them in a pregnancy, um, they would say that they want more, they, well, they would like to have a normal birth. Um, so that's what the research says about sense of coherence in relation to childbearing. Um, and the best bit, otherwise all of this would be a waste of time, there's also research that says that we can grow someone's sense of coherence and improve their health. So um, we don't know too much about it, but what we do know from the literature is music therapy increases sense of coherence, support, um, education, and um, Marilyn Ferrer has just told us that mindfulness increases sense of coherence in a childbearing woman. So that they're very uh, exciting ideas about the, the way that we could improve people's health by increasing their sense of coherence. So let's relate this back to uh, salutogenic midwifery. Um, So I think it's safe to say that good midwifery is already using a salutogenic perspective. Good midwifery uh, probably does emphasise health as well as risk. And good midwifery probably is increasing a woman's sense of coherence um, by increasing her comprehension of her childbearing. We're probably quite good at that, in, uh, helping women to understand uh, their childbearing. Um, increasing the manageability of her childbearing, good midwifery is good at that. Um, enabling women, uh, um, being actually being a resource for her and helping her to find the other resources that are going to make for uh, healthy childbearing. And I think the most important one is the meaningfulness. So I think good midwifery uh, is motivational and it is creating energy and it is persuasive and you know I talk about providing women with information so that and then standing back while they make a choice well I think we could probably be a bit more persuasive than that especially around normal birth around breastfeeding around immunisation, there are things that women could be persuaded about. Birth is certainly one of those. So good midwifery is energising and motivating. So using this approach, women would be encouraged to activate, emancipate and increase their perception of their existing and potential resources. Rogers says that. So isn't that beautiful? Using this approach, women would be encouraged to activate, emancipate and increase their perception of their existing potential resources. Good midwifery is probably all. Um, so a, um, one of the few salutogenic midwifery examples that are around is some work done by Stockdale. Um, and her friends in 2008. And Stockdale and others did um, salutogenic breastfeeding classes. So they did a randomised control trial where they compared the outcomes of the women who attended the salutogenic breastfeeding classes and compared them with women attending routine uh, breastfeeding classes. They developed the saluto breastfeeding classes to increase the comprehension, so to increase the woman's sense of coherence by increasing her understanding of her breastfeeding, to increase her manageability of, or her meaningfulness of her breastfeeding. So that is motivating her to want to breastfeed. And in that um, research, they provide some beautiful um, motivational theory that uh, it was really lovely and simple and easy to understand. And they explained that you can motivate someone by increasing the value of the thing as, long, as well as increasing the woman's expectancy of success. 
So if you want to motivate someone to breastfeed, what you do is increase the value of it for them, but also increase their expectancy of it. So that's what the salutogenic breastfeeding classes, that's the way they were designed. Let me briefly tell you what they did. Um, so the salutogenic concept was, uh, one of them anyway, was presenting the most common breastfeeding challenges as normal. And so they called them normal challenges. They provided a booklet for not if but when challenges. So if a woman did end up with sore nipples, they didn't even talk about it too much in the class. They just said, if you do end up, and when you do end up with your sore nipples, um, go and have a read of um, page nine and it'll explain. You. So it didn't undermine women's confidence when they did come up against um, challenges of breastfeeding. And um, the findings of that study were that it increased the maternal confidence, uh, it increased the, the, their sense of, of support, so they felt more supported, um, and it increased breastfeeding duration. So um, that's a beautiful example of, salu of salutogenic midwifery. So um, what we need is more research around sense of coherence and childbearing. Um, I could only find 17 studies that related to that, but it does look promising. It looks really promising for healthy childbearing, especially in relation to our uh, birthing statistics, those dreadful statistics where we're going backwards in terms of our normal birth rates. But we need more research. Um, my PhD research asks the question, how does a woman's sense of coherence affect her birth choices and outcomes? And um, I'm about halfway through collecting the data for that. Um, and I don't know if you're allowed to hope when you are doing a PhD, but I do. And I am hoping that um, a woman with strong sense of coherence does make different birth choices and she does have more straightforward birth. Um, and if we know that, um, then we can take the next steps, which are um, having salutogenic uh, midwifery that raises women's sense of coherence um, and hopefully improves their, their childbearing, their ability to have straightforward childbearing. Um, so there's more research, more research needed um, in every area. So to close, um, I would just like to talk to you about my hopes, that is, that salutogenesis and the raising of a woman's sense of coherence could become core business for midwives, core midwifery business. Um, imagine if antenatal education was framed in salutogenesis. Imagine if um, every woman going through routine antenatal education came out the other side empowered um, and motivated to confidently take control of their childbearing, I think we would see that that would make the world of difference and that we could make some inroads into those dreadful statistics. Um, so that's the list of my references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Does anybody have any? Any questions for me? Are you there, Lorraine?
Hi, it's Deborah. I think we might be having a technical difficulty with Lorraine, so I'll just facilitate the questions for Sally. Um, and I'm using Sally's mic, so it looks like Sally's talking here. <laughs> so thank you, Sally. I always, always really enjoy Sally's presentations. It just um, she knows midwifery so well, and I think she's um, you know, touching on a subject that can be useful to all of us. So I'll um, I'll take the questions and I'll hand over um, to Sally for some answers. Oh, hi, Lorraine. Do you want to do you want to step back in? Sure thing. No problem. Uh, there's some great questions popping in here. Sorry about that, everyone. I live in rural Nova Scotia, and sometimes it doesn't like the internet. So here's the first question uh, from uh, Mel. Mel asks, uh, would midwives picking up poor sense of coherence in women in early pregnancy indicate, highlight possible mental health needs in late pregnancy or after birth? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes, um, there certainly is a correlation between low sense of coherence um, and scoring high on uh, a depression scoring. Um, so women with low sense of coherence do experience more depression and anxiety. Um, so there is definitely a connection. If we were to provide the sense of coherence scale to women like we do the depression okay, scale. Fine, fine. Can you hear me? So it may be possible. To, it may be possible to. Um, I mean, one of my hopes would be that we use the sense of coherence scale during pregnancy, so we do locate that woman who is likely to experience um, uh, less straightforward birth and perhaps more um, emotional health needs, and we can locate her and we can add support. And love, and um, and we can maybe raise her sense of coherence and improve her outcome by doing that. Thank you. Um, now we have a question from Cecilia, and uh, she says, "Sally, do you have any idea, or do you have an idea of ways to work practice with salutogenesis thought and action into the student experience?" Yes, I, d I don't think that would be very different to how you um, incorporate it into any experience. So the student experience would really just be um, understanding um, salutogenesis, the concept, understanding um, what sense of coherence means and being clear about um, wanting to raise it with, with um, women and with midwives. So wanting to increase the woman's comprehension, wanting to increase her manageability, and that's what you're doing as a student as well. You're increasing her manageability, adding another resource, um, and motivating her to want uh, normal birth, straightforward birth, so by increasing the value of it and increasing her to birth. So every time you tell her that she's designed to birth, that she's grown the most beautiful baby and she's going to birth the most beautiful baby. All those things we say, that's all about increasing expectancy. Yes. So it's actually stuff that we are, or good midwifery um, is, is doing. Great, thank you. Now let me see here. So uh, Tammy asks if you're able to offer us where you can find the breastfeeding booklet is that in your references here? Um, it is, yes. Yeah. So it's the it's the two thousand and eight. Um, yes. Yeah. So the feasibility study to test design of breastfeeding. Uh, the reference there. Great. Thanks. It. So that's a, yeah, I'm not sure the, the booklet one. is there, but you could contact the. Um, Good. Okay. And lots of really good comments in here about taking that positive perspective. Are there any other questions that people would like to put into chat? Just 
checking to make sure I haven't missed any. I see typing. You never know. Maybe there's some more questions coming. We still have a bit of time, so there's lots of time for questions if you have any. There, Deb has shared a link to a self-test on coherence. That sounds like a good one. <laughs> there we go. Chris has asked a question. Is there a way to do a crash course on sal salutogenic principles? I have only one day to do our whole childbirth ed course, and the time is so limited. Um, well, the, the place that I started was um, uh, Bergstrom and Lindstrom have written a little booklet called The Hitchhiker's Guide to Salutogenesis. So I suggest that you start there. It's uh, um, it's about a hundred pages. It's really easy to read, um, and it it just has the basic principles. Um, and it's so it's pulled together most of Antonovsky's work into this booklet. So the Hitchhiker's Guide to Salutogenesis, it's called, and the author is um, Bergstrom and Lindstrom. I hope that helps. Good luck with doing that. Does anyone else have any questions? There's one from Allie. She asks, she asks, you mentioned the Maryland four-year paper. Which one were you talking uh, about? It's the latest one, Allie. So the 2014 one, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a, 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 a med, there's, there's some work in there on sense of coherence and mindfulness. Sorry, I should know. Thing, so you never know, there might be some more. There, and Denise asks if you could add it to your reference. I will, yes, of course. Uh, Deb asks, are you familiar with the concepts of centering pregnancy for prenatal care? I am, yes. And I would imagine that centering pregnancy, um, even though they may not know it, based um, that work on salutogenesis. So I think compared to um, routine antenatal education, that centering um, probably does use the salutogenic
that uh, Deb Davis has added a, a link to Sally's article that has a structured literature review for anyone who's interested. That's what that link is there. And uh, Deb Putterbrow asks, uh, do you feel that this system helps promote these concepts? Uh, which concepts? Are so, so the um, centering it's pregnancy, do they promote the concepts? Absolutely. I think that's exactly what centering does. And that's why it makes a difference. I think that it is, um, uh, it provides good information. I think it does motivate women. And I think that it, it, um, it does increase their manageability. And I think uh, it, it being in those lovely small groups where the women drive the business, um, that makes for much more effective uh, learning and probably better. And I know centering has um, really good outcome com compared. Yes, I think probably, uh, Deb, the locus of control, that's a really interesting point. There's not much about on relating locus of control to um, cell utogenesis, but there should be. So I, I agree. I think probably what um, good cell utogenic midwifery would be doing would be moving someone from, uh, from extrinsic to intrinsic locus of control. I think that's exactly right because that takes a motivational leap to do that, to move from um, taking control of things. That's a real More, more links from Deb Davis. Thank you, Deb. Denise Hind asks, when you talked about support, uh, would you see the need for first-time women to mix with others who've had a positive birth experience uh, rather than only be with other uh, pre um, I think that's that's a really good point that um, we need to be careful about the way that we design with free care and our that uh, women are supported by other women. I think probably they're better supported by other women sometimes than they are by midwives. So really harnessing those women who have birth experience um, and using to support other women is a fantastic idea. That's a salutogenic idea um, and could be well incorporated into um, any aspect of midwifery, midwifery, uh, antenatal education. Perfect. Be perfect. Yes, I'm surprised too, Kate. But um, there are lots of people talk. There are some people talking about it, but we need more people to talk, to talk about it because it has so much to offer uh, the profession. Um, Ali asks. Uh, oh, Denise is just commenting on something that Denise said about the benefit of centering pregnancy. So Ali's saying that Denise is, um, that is the benefit of centering pregnancy where women, both multiple and primates, share and learn together. And I completely agree with that. That's a wonderful model.
Well, we've got about three more minutes for questions, everyone. So if you've been putting off putting one in the chat, do it now. So Denise says, here in New Zealand, the government has been funding only classes for primates and generally only they seek classes. Um, yes, I think that is, um, generally speaking, it is the primate that attends the antenatal classes. Um, but we could, uh, I know in Australia that women, multis might do uh, uh, just a one-off, a fresher sort of a class, but no matter who, the classes are designed for. Um, though I think we could use these principles can be used so easily, and in good um, midwifery work, they probably already are. Tabitha is saying doula and maternity consumer representatives often do well at supporting and engaging with women, particularly with regards to informed decision making. Um, and I agree with that and I think we could probably argue that, that um, there's a salutogenic component to that, that doula and maternity consumer representatives are there for the woman, uh, um, are employed by the woman, uh, for the woman, to provide her with information to increase her manageability. That's exactly what they would be doing. Um, and it clearly already has meaning for the woman employing these people, um, and that they would still have a motivational. So Janine is saying, it is often mole tips who seek out classes such as hypnobirthing which aligns very well with this. And I think that's right, Janine. I think that I know a lot about hip birthing, but I imagine it's about motivating people and uh, enabling and encouraging self-belief um, in their abilities. And exactly what Stockdale says, encourage people to confidently take control of their childbearing. I think that's all being able to tap into their ability. Deb's put up the original questionnaire by Antonovsky. That's a wonderful point by Denise. That BFHI um, 10 steps encourages promotion of breastfeeding support groups. Um, so midwives need to encourage women to attend local home birth groups to hear about non-medical experiences. Um, that's a good. I think we could have, um, you know, normal birth hospital initiative or some sort of initiative where we promote um, normal birth. Of promote um, that could use a self. Last question to Hiromi. Um, I'm just letting you know that there's women getting together and giving birth without doctors, but doctors do not like the idea. But is that part of the women's rights issue or not? I'm not sure that's a question for me, but I'll have a go at answering it anyway. Um, so let me just read the question again. I'm just letting you know that there are women getting together and giving birth without doctors. Doctors do not the idea. Um, but is that part of women's rights issues or not? So, of course, you know, um, women uh, can make in choices about the way that they have their babies. And we know that if women have their babies with midwives, then they are going to have um, a better outcomes, in fact, especially if they know and love their midwives. Um, so, it's definitely um, a woman's right to choose. Where, where she, um, who is with her when she has her baby, and where she. Has 
And on that note, I just want to say thank you very much, Sally. It was a really, really interesting and informative presentation. So could we all give Sally a big round of applause? And then we're going to be setting up for our next presentation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lorraine, and thank you, everybody. Lots of applause coming in for you. And you. Uh, our next speaker is Sarah Ward. So we'll take about a 10-minute break.